About 30 years ago, a young ear, nose, and throat doctor from Uruguay decided to take a chance, make a change, and try his luck as a professional songwriter. He had always played music ever since he was a boy, and all through medical school he did concerts on the side. He had even recorded a couple of albums of his own songs. But as the child of ear, nose, and throat doctors himself, the clearest path for him was to stay in the family business. This was a nice Jewish boy doing what he thought was the right thing. It's the same old story all over the world. From Montclair to Montevideo, nice Jewish boys were supposed to grow up to be doctors. Still, the young man managed to establish himself enough as a songwriter around town that when big-name artists came through Montevideo, he sometimes had a chance to interact with them. On one such occasion, when the legendary Spanish artist Joaquin Sabina came to town, the two spent a memorable evening together trading songs and stories. Sabina, in fact, was so impressed with the young doctor that he encouraged him to give up his medical practice and move to Madrid to make a go of it as an artist. And that was how Jorge Drexler, the nice Jewish doctor from Uruguay, got to Spain and became one of the most influential songwriters of his generation. Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. I love this story because it speaks to the importance of a good conversation. The things we say to one another, even in the dark cover of night, can have real effects in the light of day. Jorge himself has memorialized the experience with Sabina in various songs over the course of his career. Like in his 2017 song, Pongamos Que Hablo de Martinez, he paints a vivid picture of the night they met. He writes, we closed four bars, one after the Fuimos other. Cerrando uno a uno cuatro bares. Montevideo had already Montevideo begun to wake up. Ya rato you predicted greatness in my future. Y and after the night we had had, who wouldn't have believed you? ¿Quién no te Disoriented and confused about my vocation, I was wrapped in my own naive happiness. Yo estaba preso en mi alegría diletante. I followed your delirious advice and went to Madrid with my guitar and my songs. Haciendo caso a tu consejo delirante. I think you know the gift you gave me changed my entire life. Creo que sabes que el regalo que me hiciste me cambió la vida entera. Back in the late 90s, when I was a foreign exchange student living in Spain and I first heard Jorge's music, he was still discovering himself in his new life as an artist. He had recently come over to Spain from Uruguay. His voice was still bright and optimistic, and his stories were often sweet and sentimental. One of the first songs of his that I heard was Era de Amar from his 1996 album Vaivén. I think this was probably one of the songs that he brought with him from Uruguay to Spain. He sang, It was a night like any other. It was at a table at a bar. It was January in that place. And she looked at me in such a way, like water from the sea. Era si una noche común, era en una mesa de bar, era enero en aquel lugar, y ella me miró de una manera. Agua de mar. As he settled into his life in Spain, Jorge's songs began to take on questions of identity. In 1999, he released Frontera, an album that explored his relationship with South America, folkloric music, and electronic music, too. In the title track, he sang, I don't know where I'm from. My home is on the border, and borders are movable, just like flags. Yo no sé de dónde soy, mi casa está en la frontera. Yo no sé de dónde soy, mi casa está en la frontera. Y las fronteras se mueven como las banderas. These small examples of Jorge's writing illustrate just how much of his own personal experience enters into his work. His songs are filled with uniquely specific and intimate details of his life. And yet he's celebrated for his ability to channel the experience of being alive through his songs. Maybe it was the process of self-examination, maybe it was expatriation, maybe it's just simply empathy, as he tells me in today's conversation. But over time, the songs and the subject matter deepened and mined more profound personal questions. In 2001, he wrote El Pianista del Ghetto de Varsovia, inspired by the book The Pianist by Vladislav Spilman. It was later made into a movie by the same name. Jorge sang, two generations less, two generations more. It's just a question of dates. I'm here and you were there. Dos generaciones menos. Dos generaciones más. Solo fechas, yo estoy aquí, tú 
If you were your grandson, if I were my grandfather, maybe you would tell my story. The subject of his own family's escape from the Nazis has been constant. Fifteen years after El Pianista, he recorded Bolivia, about how every port in South America turned his family away as they escaped from the Nazis. Except for Bolivia. He sings, everyone said no, when Bolivia said yes. Todos decían que no. Cuando dijo que sí, Bolivia. Jorge once said that it took him 10 years after he left medicine and became a professional songwriter to figure out how to integrate his relationship with science and technology into his art. But eventually, that became one of the major themes in his work. And over the last 20 years, he's looked at it from multiple angles, ranging from songs of love and communication in the time of modern technology all the way to celestial and existential questions. His most recent record, Tinta y Tiempo, opens with the song The Master Plan. In the first verse, he sings, it was in the Mesoproterozoic age when that visionary cell, in an unprecedented and heroic act, had a revolutionary idea. Tired of dividing by himself, he looked longingly at his neighbor, decided to mix, learned to laugh, and the story of the egg and the chicken was born. Corría la era del Mesoproterozoico Cuando aquella célula visionaria En un acto inaudito tirando a heroico Tuvo una idea revolucionaria Cansada ya de dividirse sola Vio con buenos ojos a otra célula vecina Decidió mezclarse, aprendió a reírse Y nació aquella historia del huevo y de la gallina Look, I could go on and on about Drexler's writing I've often thought about doing a more complete analysis of his work And maybe one day I will it's a complicated question for a writer like Drexler to make his work understood in English because so much of the strength and art is in the words. And ever since I first heard his records on a cheap boombox back in my cold, damp, poorly lit student apartment in Seville, I have continued to inspect every inch of his work for clues. Over time, that search has become both enriched and contaminated by what ultimately became our own personal and working relationship. For example, together we produced his song, Al Otro Lado del Rio, which he wrote for the 2004 film The Motorcycle Diaries. That song made history when it won an Academy Award in 2005. It was the first song in Spanish ever to win the award, and it cemented Jorge's status as a South American hero. Clavo mi remo en el agua Llevo tu remo en el mío Creo que he visto una luz Al otro lado del río. Since then, his star has only continued to rise. He's been nominated for 31 Latin Grammys. He's won seven so far, and he's nominated for nine more this year, so that's likely to grow. He's starred in movies as an actor. He's given TED Talks. He's collaborated with some of the biggest stars on the planet. In Spanish-speaking countries, he performs for tens of thousands of people. He's not just an artist. He's a fact of life in much of Latin America. His name is synonymous with a kind of a worldview, a shorthand for something larger. And I suspect that he would have reached that kind of status with or without the Oscar-winning song because his gift was so undeniable. But there is no question in my mind that I wouldn't be here talking to you today, not like this, if it wasn't for my own participation in that experience. Jorge gave me a gift when he invited me to produce the song with him, and it changed my entire life. But while the award-winning song is probably the most overt example of our work together, I actually consider the ongoing conversations that we've been having, starting sometime in the fall of 1999 and continuing to this day, to be our most productive collaboration. And that's what I'm here to bring you today. Jorge Drexler is on tour in the United States right now. He performs this week at Town Hall in New York. Then he's on to Miami, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Princeton, New Jersey, Boston, Washington, D.C., and then eventually to Las Vegas for the Latin Grammy ceremonies. His most recent record, Tinta y Tiempo, is nominated for nine Latin Grammys this year and has been received lovingly by his critics and fans. So I figured this is a good time to revisit these talks. I recorded two conversations with Drexler for this podcast over the years, and I'll play them both for you today. It's always interesting to go back to a conversation from the past and hear it with fresh ears. The first one was recorded over breakfast at his house in Madrid in the fall of 2016. 
It's amazing how much can change in six years. I don't think I need to go into all of the major events, but you'll have to put yourself in the headspace of a world before Trump and before COVID, when the planet was a little less traumatized. Jorge and I were personally a bit ragged that day, however, because we had been out late the night before and somewhere along the course of the night agreed to meet early the next morning, just before I had to leave town. So when I got to his house, he was just waking up. He had been on tour for the better part of a year and had just returned home to Madrid that week. So let me set the scene. It's about 9.30 a.m. There are two birds in a cage chirping away. I wait. I make breakfast. Coffee. Toast. I wait. I wonder if friends make good interview subjects. I wonder where to start. Then all at once he's here and we're at the table, a place he'll refer to later in our conversation as being in paradise. We're having breakfast and talking. I think in English we should do it. Yeah, we have to do it in English. I have mar- marmalade and butter here on the table. Okay, yes. And the soup. Yeah. Okay, so, so paint me a picture of what your life looks like right now. I mean, you just arrived back in, in Madrid after what feels like, in some ways, many years of being on the road. Yeah. I think this was the last tour in a, until further advice, a, a further notice. So because I'm I'm really exhausted and really tired. I, I I would I would go two or three weeks, stay maybe ten days at home, and go back to South America two or three weeks. In the last two years, I might have crossed the Atlantic twenty two times. That's that's forty four times. Mm-hmm. You know, crossing the Atlantic twenty two and one each go, way. Each way. So it's. Uh, so it's 44 times across the Atlantic, and and uh, and it's a, uh, and I'm very happy that I have a lot of work, but uh, I got to a moment that I wasn't actually enjoying uh, uh, mm-hmm. the news. You have new, sh- we have new shows, and I would say, oh, <laughs> oh, and uh, and so I I like that. I I like I really like. Uh, enjoying what I do. And I, 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 I consider myself a privileged person that can do something that I love. But, but right now, besides uh, I, uh, besides everything and, and being tired and being in a continuous jet lag for four years, and I have a, I have a family, I have three children, and I have, and I have small children, and I want to be at home in Madrid. The thing is that it grew a lot in, in another place, different from the place I live in South America, no? my career. So... Do you think that it would have grown if you had stayed there? You know, you've been in Spain for 20 years. You came to Spain 20 years ago looking for a certain kind of opportunity. Mm. You left behind your previous life as Mm. a doctor and became a professional musician. And 20 years later, you find that your success is much closer to your original home than you maybe had expected. It comes and goes, you know. I I just... In this... In the, in the first, maybe in the first 10 years, it was important to be here. The last 10 years, it would have been better for me, uh, work-wise, to live somewhere closer to South America. Maybe, I don't know, Rio de Janeiro, Uruguay, where I come from, or, or, or Miami, even. Or, or it would have been better work-wise. Because uh, Spain went through this crisis in the last five or six years, and uh, things froze a little bit here. It's funny because everybody everybody lost f- followers to the concerts, almost everybody in my generation. I did not, but I did not lose followers because although I lost Spanish followers, the South American followers grew so much here, even here in Spain, people studying here, that I would have the same number of people in, in the concert, but I didn't grow in Spain in the last six years. I just love Spain. I have three Spanish kids uh, and from two Spanish mothers. <laughs> and uh, and I, uh, I love living in Madrid and uh, it's, a, it's an amazing city and my life is really nice here. So although I'm not very much, I, I spend very few days in Madrid at, at the end of, by the end of the year, but, but, I, but, but I love it here and I, and I have my friends and I have everything here. But, it, but if I had been living in, in, in Buenos Aires, for example, I would have deepened a lot in my relationship with certain South American countries like Brazil or Peru or Colombia or, or Chile. I would have been able to go, you know, 
they call you every, they call me every two months and I can go only maybe twice a year there. So I, I lose a lot of, you know, small, important gigs, sometimes big, unique gig that you say, I won't, you know, I won't do the whole effort just for one gig. So I'm going to stay home, mm -hmm. but I, I, it would have been more dynamic for me. I would have been more in, integrated to infrastructure everywhere in, in, in South America, which is not, not only work-wise, I mean, having also creatively, I mean, I have a lot of input from Brazil, for example, a lot, lot of, I, I, every, every time I go, I, I meet new musicians, mm -hmm. there's an amazing amount of musicians there. I have a lot of, lots of connections with people in, in Chile, for example, in Peru, lots of connections in Mexico too. So I, I, I have this feeling that Spain dried out, not only economically, but basically from a creative point of view and, and from a anemic point of view. It's clearly recovering right now, but the, the fact that they let culture fall so easily really, you know, made me understand that it actually didn't play, culture didn't play such an important role in, in, in society in Spain. It, it was the first thing they let fall. Mm -hmm. And uh, everybody, uh, the government, the audience, uh -huh. I think even us musicians, I mean, we, the injection of money from the Comunidad Europea, Euro, European community, was so intense in the 90s, for example. Yeah. When I arrived here, it was so intense that people actually lost, we lost hunger. We lost that will to improve and to, you know, concerts would pop up like, like mushrooms everywhere. It was really easy to make a living on this. So, so you didn't have to think about new strategies, new approaches. You just you, you did your old stuff, and and you would have forty concerts every every summer, very well paid. And then you could you just lay down in. I mean, if you did good, you could lay down in your summer house for, and you have a vineyard, you know, mm -hmm. and and uh, make your own olive oil, and say, why should I? cross the sea to work. I have enough yeah. work here. So a lot of people didn't get out of Spain to work. And you're talking about a kind of provincialism that they started. Yeah, to you know, I don't, why should I? Why yes. should I go to play to Guadalajara? I mean, it's a real pain in the ass to yeah. go, to, go to, to, to cross the Atlantic and, and then have been jet lagged for three days and then start to get to uh, uh, all right with the timetable, then change your country and change it again. And then when, when you're adapting again, you're back to Spain and the, those 10 days that what you, you're off. So people would stay here. And what happened is that, that when Spain fall, lots of very big groups, very yeah. important groups here, just lost their audiences. And, and I, oh, I would always say, I spent my first 10 days here in Spain, which answers the first part of your question, giving connections and helping people from South America to come to Spain to play here. Your first 10 years here. My first 10 years in Spain, I spent them, you know, helping people from South America coming here, giving all the connections, all the network here yes. I had in South America. And the last time I spent helping my colleagues here in Spain go to South America because they said, we have to go there. Yes. We've never been there. Would love to. I mean, people that had maybe 20 years of a career yes. and never have never been to South America. And I said, oh, we used to do 20,000 people arenas here in, in, in Spain. Where are the bars we can play in, yeah. in, in Buenos Aires, you know? And, and I, I had that question asked many, many times. Mm -hmm. One thing I think is interesting and I, I connected with when I first heard your music 20 years ago mm -hmm. was a strong relationship to your own personal identity. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no, so my casa está en la frontera, my house is on the border. Thinking a lot about where your personal identity begins and ends and how fluid it is. And I really believe that you were looking at it from a personal point of view. You were doing your own personal exploration. But mm. something that did happen in the last 10 years is that there's a huge generation of people who had to go through something similar. And you became a kind of spokesperson for that experience. You had your own previous experience that you could help guide people back and forth across the border. Yeah. But you know, th yeah, that's, that's true. And that's, that's the way it worked for me. I write for myself. This, this is the sequence. They told me, do you write, you know, do you try to help people or do you write in some way or in their processes? And, I'm, and I say, not direct, not directly. 
I write for myself, but the important point is I consider myself part of a, of a generation. I think I share questions with people. Although I have a very privileged life and a very, but I, I think I'm open to questions in this era. So I write for my questions with the confidence that since I'm equal to my audience, I consider I, I have this empathy with my audience. I, I, I treat them as equals. I hate the word fans, for example. I don't have fans. I don't like fans. I mean, I, there's enough fanatism in the world. And uh, Say something to your fans. I don't have fans. I, I know I, 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 I prefer to say I have clients. You know, to have a client, it's, a, it's an equal relationship. I mean, you want something from me or I want something from you. Mm -hmm. And we do an equal exchange in, a, in the same level. To have fans in it means that like, you're a kind of statue and people um, idolize you. And I personally don't like that kind of relationships because I like people. I like to talk to people after the concerts. I never go to the hotel after a concert. I would stay there. I would talk to the very last person that stays at the theater, say bye to everybody that works at the theater, and then go out of the theater and meet some more people in the bar, in the, the corner of the theater, and keep on talking. I love people. I, I want to know, uh, my wife always says, Leonardo, she, she says, you love people. I mean, you, you just go and you meet people. She's a, she's a musician too and an actress, and she goes back to the hotel after the shows because she's more shy. But I, but I do love people. So I write for myself, and I consider that, that since I somehow I know people and I, and, I, and I feel equal to them, it would be useful to somebody else what I do. And you know what? I'm really lucky because it actually, it seems, it looks like it happened from what people say about this, my songs. I'm, I'm really, really lucky. I know people say, you know, we use your songs to put our kids to sleep or to dance with, with, my, yes. with my girl or... or or, or I know I went through a very difficult period and this song helped me. Yes. It, it really helped me in this kind of process, in some kind of sad moment or happy moment, you know. So I'm really grateful to, to you. Do you think that that contact with people also informs your writing now? Like, is it helpful for you to have had that interaction with people all over the world when you write, to think about the experiences that other people have shared with you? Or do you still kind of retreat inward when it's time for you to write? Mm -hmm. I do retreat inward when I, when I write. It's a, it's, the, it's a classic inward process. Once again, retreating inward myself, for me, means also being able to go in other people. Uh, I mean, because I, I spent almost two years touring and incorporating experiences and meeting people without writing almost for two years. Then I go inside myself, but I myself, I'm a, ref I'm a reflection of the other people I, I meet. So going inside this particular human <laughs> being isn't different from going inside other human beings. Mm -hmm. I just happen to go inside myself because I have myself to do that. But everything comes from empathy. Mm -hmm. I, I do have the deep belief that I'm part of, a, of the human race. Do you, call, do you say it that way? The human race, yes. Yes. And so just go inside one human and and you will be able to access to all the others, all the other humans, at, at least in their culture and their, their generation. Yeah. We have the same questions, or more or less. I don't pretend to have the same questions that people that live in Taiwan, for example, or that people used to be in, in, in 14th century had. I mean, but I do, I do consider myself and that to have the average questions about, about life. Maybe, I don't know, I, I make a living on that, so may, I might put more attention on that. So when I write to myself and I, and, I, and I think this is going to help me understand this divorce, for example, I know that it's something that's happening to 60% of, of my, my generation. So I know it's going to help me. It's going to be really good for me to write about this. It's going to be hard, but it's going to be good at the end. Uh, it's going to be painful, but it's going to be good at the end. It's going to it's going to heal me at the end. And 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 when I come out of that introspection, I also know in one side of my mind that it's also going to be understood by other people. I'm completely alone, alone when, I, when I'm right, but uh, somehow being deeply connected with myself and caring about being connected with myself or with my feelings somehow connects me with other people. 
although I'm not thinking about them when I'm when I write. Mm -hmm. Writing is r a really introspective moment for me. It's not a happy moment for me. I don't enjoy writing. <laughs> to to be sincere, like you say, oh God, oh oh, I have therapy today. Woo! I really enjoy therapy. You know, I go there and I have a great time. You know, it's not like that. You go to therapy because you need to, and and at some point you end up enjoying it at, 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 at a long term because it's good for you if you consider therapy is good for anybody. I don't know. I, I, you might do something else to, to to heal yourself, like go running or go. Or go fishing, you know, but it's not something that you do and you would say, I would, I, I enjoy that, you know, I enjoy playing live, I enjoy, the, I enjoy being on stage. I, it, that's, that's pure happiness for yes. me. But writing is, I become very bad company. I, 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 the last records I had to isolate myself because I didn't have a lot of time. And once I get in, into composition, I don't get out until I have the, I bring the mammoth home, you know, it's like, I go there, I go there and I come back with 15 songs and until I have those 15 songs in my hand, I'm so obsessed with composition that I, that I prefer not to be home because I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm not a nice person to be with. I'm either euphoric because I found this rhyme and I could close this verse or I'm completely absent in my mind because I've been looking for that rhyme for two days on a row with no outcome and so uh, I, I look through people I don't, I don't share life with people mm -hmm. it's interesting the comparison to therapy because in both cases it's a kind of a need to unburden something in yourself you know I mean I know you say some people might get the same experience from running or from fishing or mm -hmm. from going to yoga or whatever but it is an interesting choice that you made because in both cases it might not be what we want to do but we know it's what we need to do mm -hmm. and it gives me the sense that you, there's a part of you that is compelled to self-expression through writing. Mm. I think it, it could have been different. I could have had a, a different life, although I'm not really sure about that. I don't know. I don't know. The, the, the thing is, I'm already in the game. <laughs> and and, I, and, I, and, I, and I, I already learned that cycle of expression of inward. You know, it's like breathing for me. Exactly. It, it's exactly the same, the same process. Uh, there's breathing in, and if you want to breathe out, you have to breathe in before. It's like, uh, so there's a period where, where, I, where I go inward as deep as I can. And then the deeper I go inward, the more air I have to throw outside. So it's, uh, so the two, so the, mm -hmm. the, the, the going inward, it's writing, going outward is touring for me. It's a breathing, breathing mm -hmm. outward, you know, exhaling. Yes. It's, it's touring, inhaling, it's writing for me. And, and that's, it, it is as simple as that. If I if I do a brief, short inhale, I have I have little air to throw out. Then if I go really deep, I have like this deep breath, and I need both of them. I need I really need both of them, and I've built this equilibrium in, in which I'm I'm comfortable that, but I need both. I, I can't have only one of them. That's what hap what's happened. That's I'm feeling asphyxiated right now because I've been exhaling for too long <laughs> and I really need to go inward. I need to stop. I need to, to read. I need to listen to music. I, I need to, you know, I, I get these magnificent poetry books or incredible music I bought in, in, in Barranquilla or these incredible vinyls I bought in Rio. They gave me in Rio de Janeiro or in, or in Quito, you know, and and I come home and I just pile them. I have a pile like one meter high of things that I've already selected in my trips, which are, I, I would say 80% of the stuff I, I have in, in that room is very important uh, stuff for me. Only I don't remember why, because I didn't have time to just to, just to organize mm -hmm. those things. And then I don't have time to, to organize them. And I'm all, I have already a new bag. And, and you, you can see the process. You can go into my bedroom and you will see Next to my bed, these new things I brought from the last trip that used was Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico. Lots of incredible poetry books. Sometimes I have them two or three times because I, I don't remember I bought them because I didn't have time to read them. So now it's the time to stop. I want to I want I want to learn piano again. I want to go back. I, I played piano for five five years when I was a very little boy from five to ten. I want I I really want to to nurture myself 
inspire and in every way you know you go inward in this way that, that you describe as very personal and very em emotional in some ways and i think you're also somebody who is at the same time motivated by the search for new technique or for new process and so like one of the things that we were talking about earlier this weekend was how discovering something like the decima form mm -hmm. changed the way you think about language and creation mm -hmm. and i was reminded of this when you said to me a few minutes ago because i'm a human being i can express the feelings of a human being not necessarily somebody in 14th century tibet or whatever mm -hmm. but you did discover a poetic form in decimas that's very strong and very historically enduring yeah and you found a way to bring new meaning within an old form so i'm curious about that experience and how it's affected your relationship with writing and language yeah the the fact when i say that i can't relate completely to the, to the questions that somebody at uh, you know in middle ages had about they had other problems in their minds i mean surviving um, more than 35 years was uh, was already a very big thing at the time but there is a common ground there is a common ground with this guy in the cave 80,000 years ago before agriculture and with with a just developed language you know there is, there is a common ground i mean there are a, a lot a big common ground just being human it's a it's a common ground a very big common ground so you will find things that go through the centuries like the guitar for example or the decimas which are which which are uh, actually the 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 actual guitar is more or less it has all almost the same age like like the decimas for example or like the uh, sonata form in music no the, the things that per, that endured i mean no very little people write in sonata today but you have lots of people rhyming in decimas it's like a, a linguistic prodigy mm -hmm. it's a it only exists in spanish it only exists in spanish it was we know the the year it was born in, there was a book when it was born in, in 1591 by vicente spinel a musician from malaga who also added the fifth string to the guitar so i mean he was known as, as, a, as a musician and he would write songs and poetry too and at some point he came out with this structure i mean the structure was already around but he con he focused it and he concentrated it a few years later uh, lope de vega and one of the biggest writers in, in, in spanish in history named the decima decima spinella after vicente spinel he it was he was like his he admired him and he said, let's put this name to this verse. Let's put your name to this verse. So since the 16th century until, until today, it was at first alive in Spain until sonnet came in and became the, like the cultural uh, form of verse, the hype for, for the high form, form. The, the high form and the hype also for, uh -huh. it was like a fashion in fashion, <laughs> but Decima had already crossed to, to South America in the 16th, 17th, 18th century. And it disappeared in Spain, like many, many things, like, like this thing I, I started telling you, they let cultural things fall down a lot in this country. Every intelligent Spanish, I, 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 I met people that have a vision about their country. With that, and there's many, 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 many intelligent people here that I get to talk to. They, they all agree that we in Spain, because I consider myself, all, I've been living here for 20 years, uh, we here in Spain let things fall too easily. We are not a faithful audience. We are not a faithful. Uh, we not. We don't take care of, of of our cultural stuff. You know, flamenco is mu much better regarded in Japan than it is in Spain. Actually, everybody talks about flamenco, but they don't really. You know, they don't have a, an institutional relationship, a serious one with flamenco. We could talk about this a lot, but then the decima was left here because in, in the same fashion that happens with, with other things in music was left for something that came from another place that was also beautiful, like song, sonnet. But we in South America also, on, on the other hand, like it happens in Mexico, you have in Mexico, all the Baroque guitars in Mexico. Did I, I'll show you mine there, my Jarana, no? All those, there were many kinds of guitars in, in the Baroque in Spain. And 
only one type survived, that it's the actual Spanish guitar that survived mm -hmm. until today. But you have all those little guitars. I mean, you have bandurrias here and things, but you have, they're pretty much alive. In You have charango, mm -hmm. jarana, tololoche, mm -hmm. eh, vihuela, eh, cuatro in Venezuela, and, you have, and they're still alive everywhere. Cavaquinho in Brazil, mm -hmm. you know? You have all, all those sons of the guitar mm -hmm. that, that were kept and taken care of lovingly by, 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 by South American people and were forgo forgotten by Spanish. And exactly the same happened to the decima. It's a life, that form of verse, a very complex form, uh, eight syllables, uh, each verse, 10 verses, with a A, B, B, A, A, C, C, D, D, C structure of rhyme. I mean, you can go on Google. The, the way I learned it, I went on Google and I said decimas, structure, and I, and, I, yeah. and I learned it on Google, no? But you have that form of verse is alive in every South American country I've ever known. Even Republica Dominicana, once you start asking questions, somebody would always come to the post concert and say, you know, we do have that form of verse in the, in that little town in the coast in Republica Dominicana. And it's called, I don't know, it's called the Berciadores or Troveros or or decimeros, or decimistas, or, or son jarocho, or canto de mejorana, or payadores, or, or I don't know, or, or repentistas. And, and ev the, it's alive everywhere. And so I started asking myself these questions. How come this incredible meme, you know, those, those meme, uh, meme yes. no? Those regarding the cultural life as a biological outcome, which I'm completely convinced that it is, no? A kind of very elaborated biological out outcome, like like the perfume of a flower, no? Which it comes from biology, and you can understand that. And culture comes from biology in a very deep molecular way, way like your father would say, no? <laughs> in, the, in the molecular level. Yes. So I, I would say, how come this? It's so strong this meme, and it stayed for so long unchanged because in 500 years, sonnet changed so much everywhere, and you have the. The, the English way of sonnet, we were looking at, about, about a different yes. form of verses and different way, different way to close the tercets, the yes. last, last two tercets, and different structures. But decima has a different music everywhere, but exactly the same verse form. So in different countries all over South America and Latin America, they set decimas to a different kind of music that is relative to whatever their musical yeah. tradition is. Some by in th in third, so sometimes in three, sometimes in four times, mm -hmm. like milonga pang, kang, kang, tang, tang, and they, they improvise in the verse form. Yeah. It's a, in that four by four uh, bar, and, it, and you have it in Cuba, tracata, 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 and it's in, it's in three, it's in you three, know? four times, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's also very improvised. I mean, you showed me videos on the internet of people improvising decimas, and also in a kind of throw, to what we would call a throwdown or a slam, like a poetry slam, a, a, a competitive experience, right? There's something about it that mixes high art because it's a classic literary form mm -hmm. with very popular cultural impulses. Mm -hmm. And it became, thank you, it became, as you explained to me, a this, kind, is, this is coffee sounding in this. <laughs> this is idea. It became like a folk art. It became part of a folk tradition. Yeah. And the black tradition too. It, you know, something I found, which uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a tradition that it's been preserved by uh, black communities everywhere in Peru, in, in Cuba, in Mexico also from Veracruz. The, 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 uh, and uh, there's something that has to go do with rhythm in decimas that it's, it fits well into the African view of rhythm and, and, and period and, and, and trance mm -hmm. at some point. I don't know why, but it, it does. It does work. I think it's a prodigy, really, of language. It's, it, it, it holds the octosyllable, which is, the, which is the, the footprint of Spanish language. I mean, they, they say that the central length of phrases in Spanish is eight syllables. Huh. And you have... Most, they say most of slogans, most of mm. uh, child uh, songs 
are building octosyllables. Hasta la victoria siempre, for example, no? What, what, what the Che Guevara used to say, no? <laughs> to give an example, uh, those revolutionary uh, uh, slogans, no? <laughs> uh, the, there are, it's eight syllables, for example, no? I don't think, although I would love to know more about that, but I don't think there's, there's such a repetitive measure in English in yeah. poetry. It's more open, it's more, it's more diverse. And you know why? Maybe we could have a long this because English has more monosyllables. So uh, you can build, uh, it's a more flexible language and you can build different, different walls of different heights. And, uh, but in Spanish, you, we have not so many monosyllables. So, you, so the structure of a phrase is determined previously. You can't stop everywhere like you can in English and yeah. say, can't buy me love. No, you have to, no puede comprarme amor. No, it's like, uh, it, it's like you, you need more syllables to say the same. I know you've always said this about, about English, that you're so envious of great English language writers because yeah. they have so much flexibility. And of course, I was seduced by Romance languages because I think they sing so beautifully. I mean, I think, I think it's, a, it's a classical thing. We are, we are programmed as human beings to be attracted by difference because that would mean from a biological way, point of view that you, you will mate with somebody from a different town uh, and, and thus avoid endogamy. Yes. So I think that's, that's, that's really easy to, to, to explain from a natural selection point, from a Darwinian point of view. I mean, you, 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 you're always attracted and also scared by the difference, you know? But, but so I, I do love English language. I, 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 I learned it since I was a little kid. I, I love the structure. I love the way, way it works. I don't write in English. I would love to. I, would, I think I might try this year. No, yeah. no, I, I only, I've only written a few things in English. And we used language have, is very important for me. So We used to have long conversations about this many years ago, about whether or not it was appropriate and whether or not it was authentic to write in a language that was not your first language or that you didn't dominate. Oh, I used to say language. such stupid things a long ago, yes. <laughs> I think it's stupid. I think it's part of the evolution no, no. of a person. No, no, I changed my point, point of view. I changed my... I changed my... I, I don't really... I, I don't think people should care about authenticity. I think authenticity, it's like, like a sexual identity. You shouldn't care about it because there's not a lot you can do about that. Your sexual identity, you only force it when you're not sure about that. Where the, the only men I, you know that try to appear to be more men and in a, in a normal period of their life are, you know, the teenagers, for example. They, they make this big effort to show that they are men. If you're 33 and you're still making a big effort to show that you're a man, I mean, there's something wrong with you. I mean, because you, you don't have to do an effort to be, to, to be, Inside your, your 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 identity, it is what you are, and it's and, and you don't you, you don't you don't try to hide it, or you don't try to reinforce it. I mean that's that's true identity. Now I mean identity was is one of the things that is gets more sick in the society. So that's that's in a healthy way, I think. Then you have people, you know, from all the ranges of nationalism to fascism, people really trying to reinforce mm -hmm. an identity and, and basically building an identity against another identity, you know? So that's, that were, that's where lots of the problems come from. You have thought a lot about identity, and I love that one of your conclusions is that authenticity, while it may exist, is not something that can be forced or limited. There's something about sincerity, for example. I think you do, do need to make an effort to be sincere at some, at some point. But if you fake sincerity and you do something that, I mean, you're, you're being authentically fake, you know? And so, it's a, so you, you end up being authentical anyway. You're, I mean, you're, 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 I can read, if, if, if you're not sincere with me, with you, what you do artistically, I can see that you're authentically no lying to me. This is what you are. You're, you're, you're a person that sometimes lies about, you know, what, what, and, and I, I really like sincerity. I don't think you have to always be sincere, no, but I really like sincerity and I like to be in touch with what I write. I really do. It's really important for me to feel what I write. 
and uh, and uh, to feel that there is a connection between what I feel and what I write. And the central, the essence of of writing is just finding that vector that mm -hmm. goes from your heart to the paper. It's like a, a comunilo. How do you say that? Like a, a thread. Like a thread, you know, and, and just tensing that thread from both sides, from the paper and from the, your heart, and just knowing that what you're putting there, it's it's not written with a hand. It comes from, you know, when you when you find out that if you want to play the shaker, you should have this feeling that you're oscillating with your whole body. Mm -hmm. It's not just, you know, the wrist. Play. I mean, when you're really good at it, you can only play it with your hand. Yeah. But at the beginning, you have to feel it with your body. And that's exactly the same process when you write. I mean, I'm not only writing with my hand, I know, with the words. Mm -hmm. No, I'm not writing only in the, in, the, in the computer, like with my fingers. Mm -hmm. I have to feel that this is being pushed by a stronger force from behind. That, that's sincerity for me. Or if, authenticity at some point. If it's being pushed from a stronger point of view, I mean, I refer to it sometimes as opening a channel and letting something flow through. Yeah, you. that's one of the most common images. Yeah. And in that way, that's why I think it's similar to improvisation or spontaneous creation. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a different idea about this, maybe, because I think that when you are creating, you are improvising. And then you look at what you have improvised mm -hmm. and you you adjust it. And when we spoke about this the other day, because you showed me decimas and you showed me there, there's a whole tradition of people who improvise decimas. They improvise verse in real time in a very specific format. And I consider this to be almost like a kind of spontaneous authorship or a spontaneous composition. How are these different to you? I'm happy you asked me this at, at this time in the morning. No, no, we were having coffee. People yes. heard us. And so that means I just woke up. And in a very jet lagged week, I just came from Mexico. And so I'm, I, I tend to say very irresponsible things at the time of, of, of the moment. But I also sometimes, this is, the, this is the hours where I write. These are the few lucid hours I have in the day. So, so I, I, I might say lots of things here that I will regret later. But, but I do think different than when, when we talked yesterday. Huh. I, I think you have two kinds of humans relating to creation. You have el disparador y el cuidador, like the lighter and the mm -hmm. carer. You yes, know, yes, how, yes. How, will, will you the, say that? the igniter and the caretaker. The igniter and the, and the caretaker. And uh, I, I think you need both of them to write a song. And you, and, and, uh, you need both. You, I mean, you ignite, but you stop and take care of that. You ignite and you stop and you take care of that. You put it down. In a, in, a, in a paper, and, and then you go back to ignition, and, wow, and you write again, but then you stop, and you dosify it. And the improviser is not a carer, it's not a taking care, he's just an igniter. And it's a, it's a permanent igniter. Yes. Very, you know, very inspired, very selfish. I mean, he just goes on, and, you know, he just goes on, and in, mm -hmm. in, a, in, you know, in a good way, you know, just you, uh, very, very generous too. At the same time, you know, just leave things floating outside mm -hmm. and just and doesn't look back. It will always look into the future. Yes. But I think I myself, I have to take care of both sides. I can't do it another way. I just and I, I can improvise for a, for a for a long period, and it's a very very it's a it's a, it changes the way your mind feels. It's a very it's a thrilling spiritual state of mind. And uh, uh, but at some point. I never had the doubt that achieving beauty in a certain form of art that has something like a, a permanency, mm -hmm. it requires a lot of autocritics that the, that the igniter doesn't have. I mean, yeah, it, the, it, it, autocriticism is the opposite to improvisation. I mean, you just go forward. But sometimes so I, 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 I let things come out and then I come back and I say, okay, let's thank the igniter, mm -hmm. but give me this. I'm going to take a little care. I'm going to put a little order with reason with this. Yeah. And, I, and I will, and I, you know, and I will make it part of a bigger, bigger structure. So I think that's why there's lots of, of people that are incredible improvisers and, and they're not good melody writers. You have, although you have people that do both very, very, very clearly. And, and, the, and you have lots of composers 
that are, that you know that would, would come out with the most beautiful melody but wouldn't be able you know to just improvise it all the time i think the, there are two setups in 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 human uh, creativity yeah. it's like the fuel and the and the flame mm -hmm. you know you 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 really need both of them you need if you don't start the fire i mean you it, it doesn't burn but if you don't have fuel it, uh, to put inside so it, i just I gather a lot of, of emotions, but then the moment I write, the igniter has the priority. I mean, if it goes on, the you know, if if the if ideas keep flowing, you don't stop the, that pipe, that part of yourself. But you, of course, you have to at some point you have to have this relationship with yourself, like a little schizophrenic. I mean, you have to you you have to let yourself go up to some point, and but always being able to go back and and you and if you let yourself go completely i mean it's a great experience but at the end of the day you might have uh, touched five great ideas and then ended up with nothing which is fine i mean you don't have to write songs you just just you know just having a, a whole day you know of letting yourself go and playing the guitar it's it's an amazing experience in itself I am burdened with that, with the thing that I that when I when I spend, I have this, I may say also utilitarian way of relating to 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 inspiration, which is I want to have, I I I, I want to have an outcome that I, that I can work on yes. and perfection it. You can see it from a utilitarian way of point of view. Uh, you can also see it from a humble point of view because because I'm I'm saying it at some point. Not everything that I let out is you know, God sent. Right. You know? As you <clears throat> describe this, it reminds me that my early impression of you, mm -hmm. even before we met, was that you were very prolific, that you, when you arrived in Spain 20 years ago, <clears throat> you became somebody that it seemed within the business of songwriting in Spain was recognized instantly as somebody who can write a song, finish a song, write a lyric, help somebody else deliver their song. I mean, it seemed like in the mid-1990s, mm. you had at least one lyric on, you know, a lot of important records. So people yeah. came to you because you could deliver it. You mm. didn't necessarily need an angel to sit on your shoulder in order to write a song. I can do that. I can I can sit and write right now, especially at this time of the morning. Yeah. When, you know, ideas flow a little uh, more fluently. But I don't do it a lot because I'm, I'm tired and touring late, lately. I should go back to doing that. And I'm a little, I'm also, I feel, I consider myself like, you know, quite a, a lazy person too. I'm not systematical. I'm not organized. I'm very easily dispersed and uh, I'm very easily distracted. distracted. Since I get very easily distracted, I don't go very often into composition because unless somebody really asks me, asks me to do, or I myself ask myself, because I would start now writing but in half an hour, I know I have to go, for example, or, the, or, or I would, you know, since I have little children at, at, at home and then so somebody would come into my life or I will have to go and pick up some of them. And that's a very frustrating uh, sensation when you go into composition and you come out halfway. Mm -hmm. So I hate coming out halfway. It's something that you, I only get involved in when I know I can finish it. It's, it's like sex. I mean, you don't, you don't, you don't get involved in that uh, unless you know you have a, a, a certain amount of time I, I don't say it doesn't have to be that long but at, le <laughs> at least some some focus i mean you just yes. you know you know you don't get in, involved in sex in an elevator i mean you, you do but it is done it is done but it's uh, but you know but but not not in a, a, a not in a systematic way yes. I mean, you yes. don't deepen your Yes. Oh, oh yes, you might. I don't know. <laughs> I might take that out. Okay. Uh, no, no. I, I mean, I, 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 because I, I, I might be wrong with that. You know, the expression people say in English is, I guess, it's a Latin phrase: is "coitus interruptus." Yeah, right? I know, I know. I, I made that comparison before, yeah. and you know, it's, it's uh, when once you say "coitus interruptus" or you yeah. talk about sex in an yeah. interview, yeah. it comes over and over to you after the years because yeah. it's the things that people, you know, but, but they love but, us. Yeah, yeah but, but it's really, you know, inspiration is a thing that. That you that I need to close when I start. Yes. And otherwise, it's because of, why? Because I get very seriously into composition. I, I involve myself, and once you involve yourself, it's like you know, it's like taking off all your clothes and yes. then having to get dressed very quickly because yes. you have something else to do. You know, it's like yeah, it's a, once you're in there, you want to use that moment to get deeper. You know, and, and that's.
you started describing your life this morning by talking about some of the logistical and economic realities of touring and what how big choices are made you know mm -hmm. your career is more directed towards latin america today than it was before and north america too and I, mean, america. i like i like the america's concept the whole of it and the concept of the i, I like the america's concept too i like and the america's you. concept and i and, and uh, once you live in europe you you realize that there's many 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 things in common the relationship with space with history with novelty with integration with uh, yes because you're somebody who has lived in europe traveling you've traveled all around the americas you become somebody who can help to <coughs> bridge the gap for all of these different people for example discovering decimas and discovering mm -hmm. that there's a tradition of spontaneously improvising decimas in all these countries where they did not know mm -hmm that it was uh it was a phenomenon all over the americas does it change the way you think about writing and what your responsibility is when you think about uh your role in in the americas yeah we, you know we've known each other for a long time for maybe 17 18 years no leo so we we this is this is like a Yeah, this is like a, a conversation that's going on in, in front of a microphone. It's, yeah. it's, it's a kind of interaction that's been going on outside of the microphone. So that, and I think I told you this before, you know, and you, we know each other uh, from this. Uh, I think I, I realized that I came uh, to this planet to build bridges at some point. I don't know. I, I don't think it's a, I don't consider it a, only a, a positive uh, hmm. appreciation i also it, it's also a cross that you bear since i was a little child might have to do with my double origin my father being a german jew and my mother being being a, 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 an agnostic uruguayan and uh, from uh, you know trying to understand the almost opposite ways they had my mother and my father they have of the world today they still have of opposite ways of understanding reality they have different ways to relate to property to history <laughs> and to 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 religion mm -hmm. to to every possible thing you you would find so i was i i grew up i'm the older son of of that Fair of way. that union built in love by love and only by love because they didn't have many things in common and uh, and so i had to learn through love to understand that there are more there is more than one view of things once you once you try to compatible as a, as a small child try to understand your reality and see this can be right and i understand it but this other thing can also be right and you know what i also understand this point of view once you are in that you're fucked for life <laughs> you're, you're like, and you're also blessed at the same yeah. time you know you're, because it's it's your cross and it's your characteristic and you you better know that you have to deal with that because you're you're going to try to please too many people at some point but you're also build bridges between people at some point and you know you you will have doubt as a Fuerza motriz, how do you say that of your uh, doubt as a doubt as an impulse as a, a motivator as a como un dinamo like it's like the wind for a for a for a sail ship for mm -hmm. example yes no? and you will you have to you learn to, you will have always two options about things so and you, so you you will be in a good place to put one hand to one side and one hand to the other and you say and 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 build that kind of bridge so I've been always in the middle always balancing different points of view and and that 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 helps me you know to 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 make somebody understand you know what you're doing here is like what this other yes. person is doing there so and uh, i think i've been doing that for my my whole life i sincerely don't don't consider it good or bad it's just like i like we said it's identity it's what you are <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know that 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 relationship between the let's call it the igniter and the the care. What do you say? The the, 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 the caretaker, the caretaker, the caretaker, and the igniter. I mean, that's also a dual relationship. I tend to to come to a to a place where I have two options, and I just may build a bridge between the two of them. I don't take only one option. I don't know how to explain that in another way, but but I couldn't only have the. I couldn't only have you know the 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 caretaker you know just trying to be creative 
in a bureaucratic or logistic way, just, you know, just organizing my thoughts very carefully. I need the spark, you know, to, to download things, but then I also put aside for a little while that, that dynamic part of, and, and I take care of what I did. So it's, a, it's, it's again, I, uh, I build an equilibrium between two tendencies within in myself. yourself. And you will find that in, 60% of my songs in the lyrics. Yo soy el moro judío que vive con los cristianos. Este, no, yo no sé de dónde soy, mi casa está en la frontera. It's in the borderline, which is a bridge, basically. No? It's, you, you, you have lots of contradictions that are compatibilized inside the lyrics I, I use. Guitarra y voz, the whole, the whole lyric. Guitarra y voz, el que viva la ciencia, que viva la poesía. Then you have it from the beginning. Right? Long live the igniter, long live the, the caretaker. You know, it's like... And the way I compat, I try to compatibilize the scientific side I had with the with the with the with the, the poetic crazy side. poetic yeah. side, you know, with that, and, and try, you know, and try to always to have a grip on both of them. And right now I, I am unbalanced. I've been on the road too long, and I need, you know, I need the other thing. That's why I feel re really uncomfortable. I've been uncomfortable the last months, just thinking I need to go. I need to go somewhere else. I need to move somewhere else. I need, I need to stop. Yes. Not move. I, I need to stop and be at home. You know, this is, you're, you're sitting in paradise with me. This is, I mean, people left the house, the children are at the school, everybody's out, I'm alone. This is a moment where I grab a book or I, uh, hopefully I will grab the guitar, but right now I don't feel like playing the guitar. I feel like reading or, you know, just, or maybe watching a documentary or, or just, you know, stretching, doing something. That, that, I, that, I, that I enjoy loneliness hmm. and solitude. Yes. Well, you can't do it all. You have to choose one. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, 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 ha I will choose two. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll build a bridge between two. That's, that's, that, that, that's why I'm not, uh, I'm not really good at being orthodox or, yeah. or following until the end of a line. I always stop before I get to the end. The only thing I'm re I really go to the end is like, you know, like that thing of, of bridge building, no? I'm, you uh, finish the bridge. Which is a contradiction. I mean, if you, uh, the only thing I'm good at going at till the end of the line is not going, it's staying at the middle between two different <laughs> options. <laughs> I don't know if it makes any sense. Yeah, no, I'm 51. I'm, I'm, I, I, there's some things that I will change and some other things I want at this stage of my life. So it's. I see what you describe in some ways as being constantly in the balance that we all are dealing with between being a child and being a parent. You know, I mean, it's there's a part of you that wants to still experience life as a child, and there's a part of you that wants to be the responsible one. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, yeah, it it rings a bell to me. I mean, but we, since, but since I was a little child, I always felt that I, that I, that I would love to keep that childish thing. I, I mean, I I changed completely. I left my complete 10 year career of medicine when I was 30 to pursue a crazy idea of living of songwriting. And so I, I, you, I can't say I'm a, I'm a conservative person, but, but I never felt I was doing a crazy thing. I just felt I was following my, you know, my instinct and, uh, and uh, in a very rational way, you know, I was, I was very, uh, that's what I like about Spinoza, for example, no, it's achieving uh, spirituality through reason, you know, but but knowing that reason it's al servicio. How do you say it's in a, service of. in service of emotion, you know, and it's a, and it has to deal with that, and and there has to be a, a an equilibrium between the two of them. So uh, we're here. We are again talking about two a dual relationship yes. and, and 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 building a bridge between the two of them. <laughs> Jorge Drexler, thank you so much for spending the morning with me. Okay, thank you, Leo, for for this chat. It was great. One more chat. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> this time with the morning. This time with the morning and sober, which is... <laughs> yeah, I know. It would have been different. There he was, Jorge Drexler back in 2016. You still with me? To finish today, I want to play you another short conversation I had with Jorge on the phone last November for my episode about the art of aging gracefully. I called a handful of friends of different ages and at different stages in their lives to talk about how they thought about getting older. Jorge was the representative for being in your 50s, and he put me in my place right away. No somos más que una gota de luz, una estrella full. 
Okay, first of all, I, I really think that numbers, they're quite neutral. They can't be tragic. There are entities that have a value only related to other entities. So if you're, you're 45 and you think it's a lot, and I, and I wish I, you know, I, I remember I was 45 and I, and, I, and I used to think it was a lot, but, but believe me, it is not. <laughs> of course, this, this is the first time you're 45 and I can understand that it's, it might sound shocking. But I'm 57 right now. I really, I really don't know how it happened. You know, in, in in what moment I didn't see those years coming. I don't really feel that I have them. I I started gradually moving in a world where people are usually younger than me, and uh, maybe pursuing the the illusion of me myself being younger. But I I, I find myself always in situations in way in where I said at some point I I, I st- I still don't feel a big difference. First of all, 40s, I think the were my best years, the best, best years in my life, because you're, you're still very strong and you're still, and you're, you, you, you're already more or less in control of your life and uh, you're in full power, you know, in, you, you also have a big amount of experience. I started to feel the age and the things that happened to you uh, more getting to the 50s. First of all, I used to have a, a very good eyesight. And then that was the, like the, the first thing that you notice. I mean, that you can't read small things close. You start going out and wearing glasses. And that's, that's a, a very strange thing because you depend on, a, on a, this prophetic thing like the glasses. No? But, but of course, then you realize that you've always depended on on you know, on clothing to going for going out, for example. So that's it's not a you know, the same the same way that you wear your shoes to go out. So it's not that terrible. I, I think that I started perceiving my age, and started reacting in in a like in the opposite way. For example, I I, I started dancing very late. I don't know if this happens to other people, but I started taking uh, considering dancing when I was forty, and I started you know t- taking classes and and taking it seriously and maybe that feeling that you that that you start to see that your body is not eternal it's something that you know theoretically but you start to feel some point of your life and wanting to do the take the most out of your body you know and and that really made me you know i'm doing so many things for the first time always that i think that's the way i measure my age or the age in general, no, the feeling that you're in, in uncharted territory. That's a, that's a, I, I never thought about that really. I'm just starting to think about that talking to you right now. No? That's why I, I like talking because you see things through the ears of somebody else. As my father says, I learn how I feel when I hear myself say it. <laughs> yes, when you hear yourself, when you hear somebody else listening to it, I mean, because it, it also requires another ear. That's why. I say I, I know how I feel when, when there's ears to tell it to, you know. That may be, it comes into your mind more and more. Talking about getting older and the figure of death that starts to get close to you, you start thinking about it. But we are that. We are that conscience of, of, of finitude, you know. That, that's exactly what, what defines our species, you know. That's, that's what make, make us unique yeah no other things i mean no i mean the other species that make tools and other species that uh, of course they have feelings and they and but but we know that that we will be here for a time not forever and and we can see it in other persons no you have to believe in that in death because you you, you only see other people dying i mean you you never see yourself really <laughs> or, or or when you see it it's it's it's, it's no longer useful for yeah. your knowledge you know? <laughs> i don't know how to say that at the same time that same awareness of your finitude it's what drives you to do things, to write songs, to to start things, to plant things. I don't know. To 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 start thinking about. You know, I I somebody was interviewing Jorge Luis Borges uh, once, and uh, they told him, eh, Maestro, you are immortal. I've been mean, talking about his art, and he said, 
dijo, no nos pongamos pesimistas, dijo, no, let's not get, <laughs> let's not get pessimistic, <laughs> let's not get, please don't be pessimistic, le dijo, no, <laughs> I think he, he, he was so intelligent, so lucid that he wrote this, this, this book, the, about in, the, los inmortales, no, the immortals, and, and he got to get a glimpse of what it would be to have an endless life, and it's, I can't think of, of a, worst nightmare because all your drive comes from your finitude taking the death out of your perspective it's like taking the blood out of your muscles you know it's like you just you just sit there like they were sitting all the immortals in this story just not even waiting just sitting there you know <laughs> there are the children some children here in the neighborhood The, chill, the sound of the children is exactly in the right time. They came exactly at the right moment. <laughs> I was very focused on the idea of youth as it uh, related to my success because I started to work as a musician when I was young. And, and in fact, a lot of the feedback, the, the commentary I got from the world around me was not, he's so good, it's, oh, he's so young. Mm, you started really early. Yes, of and so my relationship with success was very tied to my age, and I think that's why uh -huh. I'm reflecting on it now. And part of the reason mm -hmm. I thought about talking to you was because you have reached tremendous success in an area that started to come to you a little bit later in your life. You had already kind of asserted yourself. I mean, the music, I'm sure, was always so important to you, but you had you started out as a doctor, and then you, you kind of had a, a revolution in your life later on. So you're maybe not so tied to that same sense of, of youth and success. I think it's a very bad combination, <laughs> youth and success. You were lucky enough that it, it got to a certain point and it stopped. Yes. I know very little people that were successful at a very young age that, that have a happy life. I don't know how to say that. I started making a living on music when I was 31 or 32. And then I started doing good, you know, having what you, what you say is, you could call success. Not, not a tremendous, because I never had that idea that I, that I would. I, I'm, I'm happy with what I, what I achieved, but I don't, I don't have this idea of success, you know, like a big one in my situation. And, uh, and, and, but it started working for me when I was 40. So, <laughs> you know, between, third, I, that, we, we met when I was in my mid, mid 30s. I, I was very surprised that you had my record because nobody had it. You know, it was, it was like, a, I was an example of failure in the music industry in Spain. But at the same time, I, I myself was so happy because I, I had turned my life from working in a hospital to working a, in a recording studio with guitars and, and microphones that I felt already a complete uh, success in what regarding my, my happiness in life, you know. I learned that work good happiness comes from, because you have a lot of ways to achieve happiness, you know, but, but I, I learned a deep happiness from doing what you love and it doesn't get much better than, than, than doing what you love. But when, when you start very young with that, Glory is a very powerful drug, you know, and uh, I love this phrase of Antonio Scotao, who passed away last week, a friend of mine, uh, my, my favorite philosopher and, and a big friend of mine. And he used to say, I'm going to say it in Spanish and you'll help me translate it. He said, merecimiento no siempre lleva al éxito, o sea, hacer algo como para merecerlo, ¿no? This, Deserving. ¿Cómo se dice merecimiento? What, yeah, what, deserving. What you deserve doesn't always lead to success, yes. but it leads to self-esteem. <laughs> yes, self-esteem. Uh, yes. and, and, uh, and there's nothing more than that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, that's the best that you can achieve. I mean, you, there's nothing more important than being happy with, with your choices. Sometimes merecimiento, deserving it, may come together with success. Sometimes. But they don't necessarily go together. Self-esteem, it's like the, the, highest, the highest aspiration that you can have. Mose Allison has a line, he says, when push comes to shove, thank God for self-love. That's also related with age in, the, in a very important thing now that I, that I realized that I have to tell you about. It's that, you know, 
it's also all about self-esteem. I told you that I was feeling young regarding the amount of new things I was doing. That is exactly, you know, the opposite of nostalgia. For me, nostalgia is the opposite of self-esteem. It's, it's loving somebody somebody that maybe it's you, but loving this person in another era, you know? And so, so it's actually a way of not loving yourself at that very precise moment, you know? So the only thing I can say is try to love yourself. Try to love yourself today. I mean, so do something that makes you proud of yourself today. Start something. I don't, I don't know. that. I think being old is having your behaviors or your costumes or your, or your Rituals, uh, or the things yes. that you do usually. Yes. Yeah, it's having your rituals getting old, you know. You have to renew your rituals in a, at some in, in a, a little bit, you know. Our brain is a is a is a machine designed for repetition, but that loves novelty, novedad, no? Uh, we are designed so so. I think I, I, I think it's very important your brain new at some point, you know. And, uh, and I think when I that that the, the, the moment that I lose that anelo, I don't, I don't know how to translate anelo, you know that kind of a desire, right? It's a sort of a yeah, desire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but you know, but desire is more related to 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 a sexual thing, and anelo it's more like a wish. You know, it's like a to long for something, to wish for something. But it it does not exactly a translation in, in English. I think I think that's actually what keeps me going and keeps me. We can say. To name it at some point, it keeps me young because I do feel young. <laughs> yes. No, I know you do. Although I'm 57 years old, but, but it's a, I don't really feel it. So I hope to continue to challenge myself and make changes to my rituals, but I hope that one ritual I don't change is these conversations that I have with you because I cherish them and I value them, and I'm so happy to have you in my life to have these conversations with you. <laughs> conversations are vessels you just have to change the the contenido yes, the content, the content. <laughs> exactly well jorge I, I look forward to our next vessel and uh, thank you so okay. much okay <laughs> thank you so much man i'm sorry i was a little distracted walking with the dog but that lots of things come come out of distraction so so i'm happy to do this in this way <laughs> i have seen you write some of your most important songs in the midst of incredible distractions I think destruction is good. That's Jorge Drexler from 2021 on the art of aging gracefully. If distraction is in fact a good thing, then I hope I've provided some pleasant and constructive distraction for you today. Jorge Drexler is currently on tour in support of his latest record, Tinta y Tiempo. The third story is hosted and produced by me, Leo Sidrin, in collaboration with WBGO Studios. Visit third-story.com for the full archive, hundreds of episodes going back to 2014. Check wbgo.org slash studios for all of their award-winning and compelling digital content. And at patreon.com slash thirdstorypodcast, they are ready to accept your money. I'll be back again in your headspace before you know it with another deep dive. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. This has been a WBGO Studios production. To learn more about WBGO Studios' award-winning podcasts, special concerts, live streams, and more, visit wbgo.org slash studios.